Okay, welcome to the last lecture of this semester. And uh, last lecture, uh, we finished by introducing a problem in inverse scattering, namely time harmonic inverse scattering. And uh, we saw that it's a nonlinear problem, uh, but uh, we also derived an approximation, the Born approximation, which leads to a linear problem. And uh, what I will show you today is that this problem, which is usually called diffraction tomography or in German Beugungstomography, um, actually has an analytic solution. Before I do that, um, I want to introduce you to one term, and uh, usually that is introduced at the beginning of the lecture. I postponed it to this point for a reason, uh, and that's the term of inverse crime, and uh, it just fits into our subject today, because um, it was framed for the following situation. Uh, when uh, people began looking at diffraction, Tomography, of course, they looked at it as the in the Born approximation, which is known to be dubious at least and definitely not valid in most uh, situations. Um, there were suddenly papers coming out which uh, showed that uh, the analytic solution, which I will just uh, give you in a second, gives excellent numerical results, although the Born approximation is not valid. That was a surprise because the approximation is not valid, but the numerical results were very good anyway. And uh, looking into the papers a little bit more, uh, more exact, a little bit better, it turned out that, uh, of course, they had not used measured data for their inversion. But what they had done was they had produced data using the assumption of Born approximation and then inverted that, and no surprise, of course, the uh, the result was excellent. So uh, that's somehow a thing of inverse crime, uh, and uh, what is meant by that is you're inverting artificial data that was produced using the same assumptions that you used for getting an analytic or uh, some uh, algorithm for the solution. Uh, today, this is also uh, used for uh, the um, the attitude for the procedure of uh, inverting artificial data that was generated exactly the same programs that were used for the that are used for the inversion. So definitely, that's something you should always um, avoid. Uh, because you might have some assumptions in there which are not valid. So if you, uh, so um, you might misuse these uh, assumptions for the forward and for the inverse problem. And uh, that's the reason why I never used uh, discrete data for the radon transform, but uh, I, on, um, um, for the radon transform examples, I always used uh, analytic um, data that was derived directly from the phantoms. Um, and uh, so uh, I hope I always did that. And uh, so I hope that I avoided inverse crime here because I generated the data using an analytical model and uh, then um, um, used the data or inverted the data using a discrete model. OK, um, so uh, let's come back to that. And at the core of our scattering problem was the Helmholtz equation. And I want to start very slowly today and derive the Green's function for the unperturbed, unperturbed Helmholtz equation. And that's the following. So Helmholtz equation was the following. Delta u plus k squared u is 0. u is composed as an incoming wave plus a scattered wave. And uh, the scattered wave, I think I didn't mention that, has to satisfy a radiation condition at infinity. So that means that uh, the uh, limiting value of dus over d nu, us was the scattered wave, minus ak uh, IKUS goes to zero for R, for R going to infinity. 
It can be proved that this makes the solution unique. Uh, I'm not going to do that. That's definitely some part of partial differential equations. And I'm also not going to go into detail about the radiation condition at this point. Okay, uh, now Green's function for that equation should satisfy delta u plus k squared u is de uh, oh, delta, that's um, Laplacian of u plus k squared u is the delta distribution plus the, and it should satisfy the boundary condition and it should somehow depend on the norm of x minus y only. So uh, we start uh, um, producing some uh, um, solutions to the um, to the um, Helmholtz equation by decomposing our u by separation of variables as v of r times w of phi. Now writing the um, Laplacian in polar coordinates in the usual way, we arrive at uh, the, uh, yeah, the Helmholtz equation in uh, a polar coordinates. So this is just the Laplacian inserted here uh, and with u written as v times w. And uh, yeah, of course we have this plus k squared r squared v times w, and that should be equal to zero for the Helmholtz, for, for the Helmholtz equation, for the unperturbed equation. Now, in the usual way of separation of variables, we de uh, divide this by V over W, put this one over here to the right-hand side, and we have that R squared V uh, double prime over V plus R times V prime over V plus K squared. I R squared is minus W prime, W double prime over W. And now we, of course, see that the left-hand side depends only on R. The, the right-hand side depends only on phi. So um, this must be constant. We make the ansatz that v, W is e to the i n phi. So this one over here becomes n squared. I take this to the left-hand side, multiply by V again, and we arrive at the equation R squared squared v double prime plus r v double prime plus k squared r squared minus n squared v is zero and that's Bessel's equation. Okay, um, so uh, we see that uh, the uh, v, um, so the um, part that only depends on r has to satisfy Bessel's equation. We already saw that the Bessel's function Jn satisfy the Bessel's equation that was somewhere in, uh, in 4.19, but it's a second order differential equation. And uh, we find that uh, there must be a second solution to that. And again, Using exactly the same um, the same ansatz as then, uh, using this, uh, the Taylor series, you find that there is a second uh, solution to that equation, and uh, it has a singularity at zero, and we call that solution y n or Bessel's function of the second kind. Uh, I'm not going into detail about this. Um, also, this should be. Uh, part of a, a lecture in partial differential equation. Okay, now we have a, a full uh, solution system for this ordinary differential equation and um, setting Hn, so the Hunkel functions equal to Jn plus Iyn, Hn of course also satisfies uh, this equa the Bessel's equation over here. Uh, because it's just a linear combination of Jn and Yn, which are solutions to the Bessel equation. And, but now you find that Hn of Kr times e to the i n phi is a solution to the unperturbed Helmholtz equation, and it satisfies the boundary condition, right? I mean, that's exactly the ansatz that we had. Oops, that's exactly the ansatz that we had. We write u as v of r times w of phi. Uh, to be a solution to this Bessel equation, uh, we need to choose V as Hn of k times R, uh, W as um, 
Yeah, that was our ansatz here, e to the i n phi. And uh, to, uh, yeah, and um, this is the right one because it actually satisfies the boundary condition and I'll not be uh, computing this here. Okay, um, so uh, setting n equals to zero, this depends only on r. So definitely that's our candidate for the Green's function. So H zero of K times R is a solution to the Helmholtz equation, R of course being the norm of uh, X. And uh, so this is a polar wave. It emanates from zero. Uh, with a singularity at zero because y n y zero has a singularity at zero, and uh, it turns out yes, in fact, this is Green's function. Okay, uh, so we have that g of x and y is minus i over four h zero of k times norm x minus y, and uh, yeah, I can now write uh, the um, and that's all. All that is only true for two dimension. It turns out that in three dimensions, the uh, Wien's function is much simpler, but we restricted ourselves to two dimensions, so I'll stick with this. Okay, so uh, now plugging this in into our formula for the Born approximation, we have that ub of x, which is the uh, Born approximation for u, is given by minus k square over i integral over s1 h0 of k times norm x minus y q of y ui of y dy. Okay, um, now let's assume that uh, we have plane incoming waves. So you, whoops. Okay. I don't know where I am. <laughs> I'm sorry. Here it is. Okay, so let's assume we have an incoming wave um, uh, in direction theta, planar wave. So it's of the form e to the i k x times theta. And uh, let's assume that we can measure the sound pressure before or after the um, uh, the, the object. So uh, the in this small uh, image over here. Uh, the green one is the unit circle. That's where our object is. We have an incoming wave, a plane wave in direction theta. So it's coming in from the left. And we measure the sound wave uh, either on the right bar, on the right line, or on the left line. So uh, either behind the, uh, the object with respect to uh, the incoming wave theta, or before the object, um, that's uh, that's what that's the left line denoted by minus l. Note uh, that this somehow um, corresponds to our idea of measuring a transmitted or a reflected wave. If we go to the right hand side, that would be the transmitted wave. So we're measuring the wave that went through the object. On on the left hand side, we would measure the um, the uh, waves that were reflected. And in a way, that's the situation that we're in in uh, usual ultrasound in the doctor's office and also uh, in geophysics. Okay, so we assume we can measure that. So our measurement operator is given, of course, Q is what we are going for, right? I mean, this Q, we are trying to solve this integral equation over here for Q. And uh, what we have is uh, data for every in incoming wave, for every incident wave theta in all directions theta along the whole line that is parametrized by S. So what we measure is G of theta and S, and I call that RQ of theta and S. I call it R for a reason, because we will see that somehow this is a generalization of the radon transform. And this is, uh, so we measure the sound speed, I denoted it by U, I just realized. So it should be a U over here. Ah, U, B, you get the idea. U, B of R times theta plus S times theta perp. And plugging in again, this um, formula over here, this is minus k squared i over four 
integral over S1 H0 of K times L times theta plus S times theta perp minus Y Q of Y e to the K times uh, theta I K Y times theta dy, right? I mean, that's exactly uh, now plugging in everything we have. The incoming wave is something like e to the I K uh, uh, theta times Y. And uh, here I plugged in the, uh, the definition of X and Y. Okay, um, now um, we assume that L is fixed. We assume that the absolute value of L is larger than one, and that could be negative or positive. It's, if it's positive, we are measuring the transmitted wave. If it's negative, we're measuring the reflected wave. Okay, um, interestingly enough, there is an analytical inversion formula, and that's Wolf's projection theorem, which was uh, proved in by Wolf, I think he was a physicist, in uh, 1969. And uh, it goes like this. Um, define A of sigma as plus or minus the square root of k square minus sigma squared for absolute value of sigma smaller than k, or plus minus i times the square root of k squared minus sigma squared for absolute value of sigma smaller, larger than k. Oh, I'm sorry. That's something that needs correction. And uh, plus minus, that means for, um, uh, for L larger than zero, we select the plus over here. For L smaller than zero, we select the minus. Okay, um, then it turns out that RQ, where RQ is the, uh, the measurement that uh, I've made, uh, so in the Born approximation, RQ hat of theta and sigma is i times square root of pi over two k squared one over a of sigma e to the i absolute value of l a of sigma times the Fourier transform of q and uh, that's a of sigma minus at the point a of sigma minus k times theta plus sigma times theta perp. Now, if you look at this, then what do we have? We're going for the function q, which is a two-dimensional function. Now we have RQ hat of theta and sigma. That's exactly what was on the left-hand side for Fourier slice, right? So that looks very much like Fourier slice. And forgetting about this over here and about the concrete stru structure over here, um, there's the two-dimensional Fourier transform of Q on the right-hand side. So at least from this point of view, there seems to be a lot of similarity between this and Fourier slice. Right, just from the form of it. And uh, in fact, think of uh, the following. I mean, we're describing wave, wave transmission here. Now, assume that uh, the frequency goes to infinity. So we get more and more energetic waves. Then at some point, we'll somehow model X-ray, right? I mean, if we let omega tend to infinity, uh, then this will be more or less uh, describes the situation in X-rays. So the um, um, somehow we have the feeling, okay, if, when we're that high, then the um, the uh, rays will just the waves will lose their wave character and will move like uh, like um, particles, and they will just go through. So um, in a way, we would assume that uh, for omega going to infinity, this should model the uh, a particle model, a transport model. And uh, that was exactly what we uh, what we did for the radon transform. So in fact, uh, this the RQ is in some way a limit of the radon transform. And um, so it's not very surprising that we get something here which is uh, close to the radon transform. And in fact, for in a special sense, uh, if you let omega tend to infinity, then the um, the um, uh, uh, then uh, uh, Fourier slice is a limiting theorem of this theorem by Wolf. Okay, um, for the time being, ah, well, I, I would like to prove that now. And um, I already warn you, the main idea behind it will be once 
special property of the Hunkel function, which I'm not going to prove, but just quote from somewhere. I'll give you the quotation. And um, so uh, this is a little bit disappointing maybe, but uh, anyway, um, I, it's not so hard to prove, but also I'm, I'm not even not into uh, the Hunkel function. So, so um, I'm going to do that in the next part of the videos because I would like to keep videos for up to 20 minutes.